Hold on, let me get some pins. Nothing seems to be like it. All right, so I have, uh, the way I'm going to do it, I do bring the solutions for, from last week, and I also set up some uh, new problems. So the bare minimum, you should do this. And what I will do is, uh, from this week onwards, I will also suggest what to read. So at least try to read. Even if you do not understand everything, it is better to have an informed customer, right? So you can pick up the solutions a bit later. And uh, I will also, yeah, you, you can uh, give it to me. Or maybe we, when we take a break, you can pick up one each. Uh, so I'm most likely we will finish up uh, detection today. Uh, so this is detection of uh, signals. Uh, in noise. Uh, so the way I have written, we should be <coughs> none of these pins. None of the pens are uh, writing. So can you, can you just bring, bring me four black pens? Uh, you can look at this. this one. Here, let me give you. All this is Django. Let me get. You try it. Yeah. All of them. So get me some four black pens. Here. Yeah, no, I need, uh, yeah, right. Few pens which are uh, ready to write. All right, so the way I have written, uh, it looks like this is the problem we are trying to address. Okay. Remember, signal is always, it's a function of time, right? Uh, so we will come to this a little later. So right now we are looking at a simpler problem, <coughs> something of this nature. Uh, so, uh, so it could be that, uh, so this is the signal, you have noise, so let's say this is your, uh, generally this will be the problem. So what you can think of is that you are sampling your signal and generating these RIs. So then you may ask why this is constant. Maybe our signal was actually like this, right? It could, our signal could have been a pulse, right? So in reality, we transmit a pulse. So what is coming back is pulse. Uh, so even if you sample this, it would be like this problem, right? Constant plus noise, etc. So this is, uh, in fact, the problem that we resolved uh, last time. But remember, the basic uh, concept, uh, the conceptual framework is that you have data, 
So data is everything that you have observed. You don't observe this. You observe this side, right, the data. We don't know whether the data is of this form or this form. This we can uh, call hypothesis H1. This is hypothesis H0. Remember, hello, you need to catch up with, hello, because we went through all this last week. So this is the data. The reason I put a T here is it's the, uh, to transpose this vector. So that the data is what you see there. The way I have written, this is a row vector. Now, if I put a transpose here, this becomes a column vector, right? So it, it, that only is for convenience or notational sake. Uh, so uh, this is a binary hypothesis testing problem because two situations. If you have three different situations, it will become a ternary. Or if you have four situations like QPSK, uh, that will be a, uh, a four hypothesis or quaternary hypothesis testing problem, and so on. So in general, you could have an emery detection problem and whatever it is, uh, the, always the data comes in. You want to do something to the data and make a decision. The decision is you have to say whether this data came from H1 or H0. So another way to look at this is conceptually, we want to design a receiver which will, uh, this is the whole space, which will somehow partition the whole space into two regions. So of course, the job of the receiver is to find out how to do this a partition. So it may do this partition like this. So this will be Z0, and uh, you know it may come back and say this is also Z0. Okay. So of course, the question is, it's easy for me to draw something. Uh, how do you, this is what we went through last time. So this whole region is Z0, right? And the other one is Z1. So this is Z1, right? So how to how to do this uh, partition, right? Also, from the problem, generally, uh, the statistics of the data, if you assume the two uh, under the two hypotheses, are generally known. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Look at this problem. Under the hypothesis that uh, each, each uh, received data is signal plus noise. If the signal is a constant, then the ra randomness of this is dictated by the randomness of the noise. If the noise is Gaussian, Gaussian plus a constant is Gaussian. So you can conclude that you can figure out what this uh, density function will be. As I said, these two are two different density functions. But generally, we may write like this because there is no confusion. It is pretty clear that we are dealing with uh, this. So your job might be, remember, nobody really gives you these things. Your job is, of course, to do problems so that you can take the problem in context and try to figure this out. As you have seen last time, you do need these things to do the receiver design. Right? So when I say receiver design, uh, this is conceptually what we need to do. We need to divide the observation. This is the observation space. Uh, so what that means is whenever you make a decision, the R is going to come and sit somewhere, right? This is the R vector. What is the R vector? This is the R vector, the data vector. So of course, if you have already done the partition well, right now you can see this R fell here. That belongs to the region Z1. That simply means that R is saying that the hypothesis behind that is H1. But we could only do that if you have done this partition. So the question is, how do we do the partition? So we went through all this. The basic idea is whatever you do, minimize the risk. It sounds so obvious. But that's the base rule, right? 
So uh, risk is the expected value of the cost function, right? We went through all this. In other words, every action has a cost associated with this. So this is the cost associated with deciding in favor of, I'm not going to go through the whole lecture, but I'll give a quick overview. Deciding in favor of uh, H1, HI, uh, when HJ happens to be a, a true. So if I is not equal to J, then that's a, ro a wrong decision. When I equal to J, it's the correct decision. So generally, we can assume that if even if everything has a cost or a reward, when you make a wrong decision, the cost is higher. Right? Multiplied by the probability of deciding in favor of HI, and HI is uh, true, HJ is true, right? So this is decide in favor of HI. This is the decision, this is what the receiver output, this is what the transmitter is, so when HJ is, uh, is the truth. So this is probability of AB, which you can write as probability of A given B, so this you can write down as Cij P of HI given HJ multiplied by probability of HJ, right? And this is, of course, uh, you can see from here, this is probability of HI, deciding in favor of HI. That means, the A, remember, now you have these density functions. Uh, you can bring them, these two density functions over this. And you see, you have two regions, two density functions, so you'll have four integrals, right? Uh, so you can see, this is the density function uh, when HJ is true, this is the density, the density function of the data when HJ is true. And you are deciding in favor of HI. The only reason you are deciding in favor of HI is because R falls in the ZI region. So that's this, right? So everything is, uh, you can put it together. Uh, so uh, this is what we, we put all these things together. We went through this. So I, of course, goes from 1 through the number of uh, hypotheses. J is 1 through M. Same here. And I, we specialized last time for m equal to 2. That is a binary case, right? So you can, uh, so in general, remember, there are m squared integrals. If m is 2, 4 integrals, right? But of course, you also know that what happens, any integral, if you, it doesn't matter. If, if you integrate over all these regions, you get 1, right? So we, we made use of all that. And so the whole idea is the risk, we want to minimize it. So what is the freedom here? Freedom is in selecting the ZIs. So the problem is like this. Somehow select the ZIs in such a fashion that the overall risk is minimized. Okay. Because remember, this is given one way or the other way you may come to, you may decide on these numbers. One obvious way is that when you make a right decision, there is no penalty. When you make a wrong decision, there is penalty. Let's say one or something. All the costs doesn't have to be equal, right? But if you take CIJs to be one, when I is not equal to J, that goes to the communication. And this simply becomes the probability of error. So risk is the same as probability of error when the costs are one or zero depending on whether i is not equal to j or i equal to j. Any questions? So we went through all this. I'm not, we went through the minimization. And, uh, <coughs> and the minimization said, remember, we set it up so that it came out something like this, right? So this function came out to be a constant plus In the case of, now I am doing for m equal to 2. In the binary case, you have the expression. I think it was like this, right?
So if you check your notes, this is what we had. So it says, remember, we want to minimize. This was a positive quantity we saw there. So this quantity, of course, can be positive or negative, depending on whether this term is higher than this or this term is larger than this. And uh, what was here? I think there was some other, con there were two constants here, right? One constant here, one constant here. So the argument was that when this term is, uh, oh, can someone check it? Is this right or is, was it? Huh? Yeah, yeah, that's what I, what I wrote initially was right. This way, right? All right, so you can see if uh, the only two possibilities, this term is larger than this term. Remember, data is coming in, so R is a vector. You plug in the vector, you will get a number here, because this is a density function. Same vector you plug in, you will get a different number here. So these constants are, remember, it depends on C, A, J's and P1, P0, etc. So if this number could be either this number, the left, this side is larger than this or smaller than this. So let's say this number is larger, then you see uh, this whole quantity will be, so you have two cases, right? So I'll write it here, F R given H1 is greater than, multiplied by a, you have a constant here, a constant F R given H0, and you have another case, the same thing. All right, so I just wrote, the same term twice. So, so if, <coughs> let's take this case. If this term is if this term is greater than this, then this whole quantity, this minus this, will be negative. The quantity inside the parenthesis will be negative. That means from a positive quantity, you are subtracting something. That would mean that at that point, that R you really want to put it in Z naught, or we, if this we want to decide, we want to say that that R in favor of is is H naught or Z naught. Because if you if R falls in C naught, then you say the uh, H zero is the truth behind it. The conversely, if this is higher than this, which we, the obviously the other side goes to H one, which means if this is larger than this, then this becomes positive, and you don't want the R here. That means the R should be in the complement of that or Z one, which means this would be H one. So we can put this together. Uh, this being positive, these constants I showed last time were positive. So we came up with uh, this condition. So what was it? P naught C O one minus C minus. Okay. Right, so let's say we call this gamma. So this is a threshold, right? Hmm? Oh, what about? Yeah, yeah, right. All right. So this this is <coughs> when you uh, when you ultimately simplify, you are going to get a function of R, right? R is data, so generally the notation used is, uh, so this is known as the, uh, this, this thing is known as the likelihood ratio test. Or LRT, as I said last time. Okay. As I said, these are two different functions, so two different density functions. You know, I'll talk about this, remember, so if you look at these quantities, so one thing you may ask is, who is going to give you a, the cost, fun, cost, right? So you may, you may be deciding, so the point is, it is subjective, because he may decide one set of costs, and you may decide another set of costs. So you can argue that maybe that's not a desirable property, right? I just want to mention that the costs are subjective, <laughs> These are the a priori probabilities, right? All right, so with that in mind, you can simplify this. 
and uh, as we saw sometimes this the uh, another equivalent form this is not transformation equivalent form is that you can yeah you can take the logarithm etc but ultimately so long as you do it properly we will get it as the uh, reduced uh, the simplest form of data so this is the and everything else we bring it to the right side and put it in again so this threshold gets modified so either you can write it like this or this is uh, i'll talk about this form in more detail so this is also known as uh, so you can already literally see what it means the sufficient means uh, that um, as far as this problem is concerned this particular function of data is sufficient to resolve what is the problem here we want to know whether this data belong uh, data is suggesting that what is the hypothesis h1 is true or h h0 is true so all you need is this function nothing more nothing less so everything about the data that need to be extracted has been extracted by this function i will also show you uh, this a uh, little later a slightly different way so now of course you need to or uh, solve a few problems and uh, a compute if you do this what is the receiver uh, actual receiver so let me do a couple more problems and then we will go back and address the this uh, subjective issue okay uh, but uh, before that so why are we doing all this so, so we have l r uh, we are of course doing it to find the optimum receiver so this is the l r t and then we also have uh, we can uh, compute all these quantities i went through all this last time probability of detection is what detect uh, uh, the receiver says h1 is true when h1 happens to be the remember this is the receiver story receiver output this is what you transmit so that's probability of detection detecting uh, output is detected as uh, target when target is present so this is this from here you see this is the same as saying probability that l is greater than uh, eta right when h1 is true so these are different way look at here when will you when will the receiver detect it as h1 when the this function sufficient statistics exceeds the eta right and similarly this is a probability of a detection right probability of detection probability of false alarm a uh, false alarm means you are getting excited for no reason so probability of uh, uh, detecting a target when uh, there is no target receiver says yes actually the, the data has no target So the receiver receiver will say yes only because l exceeds eta when h0 is true okay. and pm is you miss it so you say no when actually there is a target so this is probability that l is less than eta under h1 right so generally you need to compute all these things and the last one you don't need it because pm plus pd is of course one right so if yeah right right from here right yeah right and the last one is not really interesting so there i don't think there is any name so probability of h not when h not is true uh, so this is what is this anyone what would you call this when there is no target you declare it as target which will be normal life right so generally you need to compute all these quantities i am also a little later i will also show the relation between pd and pf remember of course generally what we would like is we want this to increase and this to decrease right and this to decrease of course this increases this will decrease 
uh, but it's unclear. Uh, the best, we also want the probability of false. Everything doesn't go your way, right? So you will see that these are actually coupled in all uh, characters. So generally, people would like to see this behavior. So this is what, uh, in every problem, this will be the, uh, how, what is the PDP of uh, relation? Okay. Maybe for various parameters and so on. Uh, so this is known as receiver operating character. So, you know, you can already characteristics. Of course, this has a specific uh, shape. And a uh, little later, we will show that for, it doesn't matter which problem you're looking at, this is always true. So that will be, uh, a book has done it one way. I'll show you a better way to do this problem. So let me quickly uh, uh, do where are the notes this fellow brought up? I thought he just brought in some notes. Anyway, we'll see. I did uh, write some notes for you, and it was getting copied. I thought, did he have some notes when the fellow came in, in his hand? Here? No, he some. Oh, yeah, yeah, this is here. So I'll give you this also. Some notes on sufficient statistics, and also, uh, since the jointly, jointly Gaussian random variables are important, I wrote up some notes for you, which you can read it at home. So remember, this class is a lot of material. Uh, these videos is already posted in the Blackboard, or I will forward it to you that way. If you have been sleepy, you can uh, look at it. Or if you just want to clarify, et cetera. But I don't want you to miss classes, OK? Don't say, uh, because a lot of things, uh, the cl class is important, and I want to see you, and you should be here. Otherwise, I will end up uh, lecturing to the blackboard, right? So let me just uh, very quickly do the one problem that's already done in the book, and then we'll go into another problem. So let's say the data is, uh, so I'll do it a little fast. It's already solved in the book, so maybe you have all seen it. So I hope you can, uh, you know how to read this problem, right? So let me read it for you. You collect, look at here. You collect n samples. All the samples are independent, identically distributed. Moreover, so you may say, what is the difference between the two hypotheses? You look carefully. All the data in, under both the hypotheses are Gaussian. You can see it. And they have zero mean, so no difference so far. So the only difference is in the variance. So, uh, so by observing the data, we want to figure out whether the, va the variance of the data is sigma 1 squared or sigma 0 squared, right? That's the problem, right? All right, so we need to f f find out this. You see. this is, we know that uh, LRT is optimum, so I just need to find out. So the rest is your skills. This much you can write, but if you have if you have never solved a problem, you are not going to proceed beyond this. You will be sitting here, right? So just writing down this answer is uh, give, gets you nowhere. So you you your entire skill is solving the problem. So first of all, I'm going to make use of this. This says, uh, I mean, all the samples under both the hypotheses are given to me as independent. If it is not independent, if it is independent, I can write this as like this. Right? So the only because it is given to us. Remember, R means, of course, R1, R2, etc., Rn. Right. So this is true. 
and each one of them is of course of the form square root of 2 pi sigma 1 squared e raised to minus r i squared over 2 sigma 1 squared product here uh, same thing product here i equal to 1 through n right 1 over square root 2 pi sigma 0 squared e raised to minus r i squared over 2 sigma 0 squared so of course uh, this product here comes as summation so you can see this reads now sigma r i squared over 2 sigma 1 squared <coughs> and e raised to minus summation r i squared over 2 sigma 0 squared and there is also a constant here so this is uh, sigma 0 over sigma 1 to the power n right uh, compared with gamma h1 h0 so of course I can write this as uh, e raised to minus uh, 1 over sigma 1 squared minus 1 over sigma I think uh, uh, sigma r i squared right i equal to 1 through n right there is a 2 here somewhere compared with uh, h1 h0 <coughs> gamma multiplied by what is it uh, sigma 1 over sigma 0 to the power n so let's take the logarithm right you got lost where did you get lost or you This is okay. Remember, if you want, you can go home, and if you want to redo another problem, uh, try this one. I mean, put a constant there. So they have same mean, which is different from zero. You just go through this. You need to simplify properly. Uh, and uh, later you may want to also, you can also do this. That will be a third problem. Uh, one of, the, yeah, right. So you'll see the solution here now, right? All right, so you see, I can get rid of this E, right? Uh, so I, that means I take the logarithm on the other side, right? So there's a logarithm. That much is okay, Log, natural logarithm. And then there is this, so I can also bring the 2 here, that's not a problem. And then this minus I can absor absorb here, so there is a minus here, plus here. So this of course is, so what is it, uh, sigma 1 squared minus sigma naught squared over sigma 1 squared, sigma 0 squared. Uh, summation r i squared i equal to 1 through n. Many ways, but yeah, there is one, so sigma 1 squared, Sigma 0 squared I can bring in over there because they are constants. Then 2 log this whole quantity. So I'm going to call this thing to be eta. Okay. So that much is fine. But you see, so here I have sigma 1 squared minus sigma naught squared. I, I can bring this to the other side provided this is positive. So you just need to have two cases. Uh, this is ri squared, right? So the, uh, the LRT turns out to be I equal to 1 through N sigma RI squared uh, greater than less than H1, H0. Oh, not go, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, no problem, right. So let's say we do it here. So we have to consider two cases, sigma 1 squared greater than sigma naught squared and the other way. So sigma 1 squared is greater than sigma naught squared, this is positive, so you can divide by that, not a problem. Uh, the inequalities will stay the same. If this is negative, the inequalities will flip, right? So that's all, so you can just, so the LRT is still the same. So I'm going to, this was eta naught. I'm going to divide by this and I'm going to call that whole thing to be eta, okay? Remember, if sigma one squared is so positive, then I can divide this by this. 
and that's the one I'm going to call eta. So that's all I'm going to write here. So in the other case, it will be i equal to 1 through n. It will be the other way, right? Uh, so of course, if these uh, these values are remember, these values are known. Only thing that is unknown is whether the data corresponds to this one or this one. So then you can set up the R I squared. So this is the receiver, and in this case, you also notice that this is the sufficient statistics. Okay, just make an observation. Now, if you want P D etc., I equal to one through n, right? So this is where a little bit uh, probability helps you. Uh, so remember, uh, Ri's are zero mean Gaussian. So if it is zero mean Gaussian, if you square a uh, Gaussian random variable, what is the density function? Anyone? Hello? Oh. Square a Gaussian random variable. What do you get? Square of a Gaussian random variable. Anyone? Is chi squared, you have heard, right? So check it out. I thought you did the homework. <coughs> so you see y equal to x squared. X is x has to be zero mean and unit variance. Okay. Then you see the density function of y is what? One over dy by dx, right? A summation fx of x. This is the formula. X has two solutions, right? X1 is square root of y, X2 is uh, minus square root of y, and uh, dy by dx is what? dy by dx, you can see, is 2x, right? 2x means uh, x is square root of y. So this will be a 1 over 2 square root of y e raised to minus uh, so then we substitute the Gaussian density function, 1 over square root of 2 pi e raised to minus xi squared, that's y by 2, uh, 2 times because you have solution due to x1 and x2. So if you check the book, you will see that this, I think this is the density function for a chi squared with uh, uh, and one degree of freedom. So this is chi squared. You add up uh, uh, different chi squared. You get chi so this is not a symbolic notation. Is x is chi x is normal, but y is chi squared with one degree of freedom. So if I define y to be sigma x i squared where each xi is uh, in the, uh, normal with zero mean and unit variance. This is chi squared with n degrees of freedom. And if I remember, you can just, uh, you can use the best way is characteristic function to find out this. I think this, the density, see whether you can do this at home. Although it is done in the book, so there is no big secret. I think this is what it is. Okay. Can you check the book? Is this or maybe this constant is not right? All right, so it's, I think it is either, uh, let me see whether I have it here. Yeah, gamma n by 2, not uh, gamma n by 2. You notice when n equal to 1, which is the n equal to 1, you see this is minus half. So that's what you have here, minus square root of minus half in the denominator. N equal to 1, gamma half, I don't know whether you know it, I think it is square root of pi, right? It's a fable, and here you have square root N equal to 1, so 2. 
and either square root of pi or square root of pi by 2 and the rest you can see this. So this is more interesting thing is what happens n equal to 2 this is interesting f y y will be n equal to 2 this is gone yeah, gamma of 1 is 1 so this is e raised to minus y by 2. What is this distribution anyone? What did you say? Well uh, exponential right? Rayleigh has a quadratic term, right? All right, so why am I doing all this? Because you can see that this is chi squared. Because, uh, because Ri's are Gaussian. But we do need to do some normalization. Okay. So you see, if you do it right, by the time you get out of this course, you will be also experts in probability. Uh, because you need to be able to solve problems. Remember, our uh, xi's are normal with mean and variance sigma 1 squared under hypothesis h1, and normal with mean 0 x sigma 0 squared under hypothesis h0. So what about xi squared? Anybody? Xi's are normal. So what about xi squared? We just went through this. Not chi squared. Look at it. That's why I'm saying you have to be careful. Look here. Uh, the chi, it is chi squared if the variance is 1. Here the variances are not 1. So that, of course, the easiest way is what? Anybody remembers? How do you make this random variable into variance equal to 1? Square? Divide by sigma. So. Uh, this will be, this squared will be chi squared with one degree of freedom. Uh, this is under h1 and this will be chi squared with, uh, so here you divide by sigma naught. So this will be chi squared with one degree of freedom under h naught, right? Because, because uh, remember I explained you, what do you mean by degree of freedom is this? Here we are not summing up anything yet. This is just one random variable. Yeah. Right? What? Like Here? Yeah. yeah, xi is one, one data vector. I mean, one data point, right? Like here. Yeah. So one random variable, Gaussian random variable. If I normalize it and square it, you get chi squared with uh, one degree of freedom. Now, of course, if I add up n such uh, random variables, I get chi squared with n degrees of freedom. So that is also true. Okay. Now look at your problem. Your problem is, I mean, this is, let's say this is Ri. So your problem is sigma Ri squared, right? Where is it? Somewhere here, right? <laughs> So you see, let me do L over sigma 1 squared. This is the same as sigma Ri over sigma 1 squared, i equal to 1 through n, right? Because I can divide by sigma 1 squared. So if I divide by a constant, on, I have to do this on both the sides. Right? So if this is true, this is certainly true, right? So if you want to compute PD, for example, let's see this. And let me call this to be y. This is a, y is just a same as L, a scaled version. So PD is what? Deciding in favor of H, it's already here somewhere, right? Hmm? When H1 is true, so we'll decide in favor of H1 when L is greater than eta, right? Under H1. Now look at this. L is not chi squared, right? Because of the, its variances are not one. But L over sigma 1 squared, you can see from here. Ri over sigma 1 is uh, Gaussian with this uh, unit mean, unit variance. So this is chi squared with 1 degree of freedom. This is chi squared with n degrees of freedom. So see this I am going to do this way. Saying that L is greater than eta is the same as if you divide by a constant, nothing changes. But L over, but the interesting thing is this has become chi squared under h1. So this is 
probability of y greater than eta o over sigma 1 squared under h1. But the density function of, so this is f y y under h1 uh, d y, y goes from eta over, I won't write <laughs> below this, this is not, sigma 1 squared to infinity. Okay, so let's pick it up here. So that means PD is now eta over sigma 1 squared to infinity. You can plug this one, y n by 2 minus 1 gamma n by 2, uh, 2 to the power n e raised to minus y by 2 dy. See, a lot of calculations. That's where I can separate out the people. Because just knowing one line saying LRT is optimum and walking out is not going to make, uh, make you solve any problem. So how about, uh, uh, so we'll simplify this in a minute. Let me also bring in PY, I mean P, D, PF. Remember, for receiver operating characteristics, you need both. One is the probability of detection, probability of false alarm. Probability of miss is one minus probability of detection. So you have everything. So this is when L is also exceeds gamma under H0, right? Under H0, uh, to make L chi squared, what will you divide it with? Anyone? Look at here. What? Sigma 0. Of course, you can divide by sigma 1. There is nothing wrong with it. But uh, Ri under sigma uh, under H0, Ri under sigma naught is chi squared. Okay. So the whole point is this is chi squared with n degrees of freedom. This is also chi squared with n degrees of freedom. But under different hypothesis, you are dividing by different constants. Okay. Right? Everything is clear, right? So here, of course, this is true. I can write like this. It's also equally meaningful. Hello. This is meaningful, but this is not chi squared. So I'll, div I'll uh, divide by the right quantity, sigma naught squared. But this is now chi squared under H naught. Look at here, right? Uh, so you get this is the same as uh, gamma over sigma naught squared to infinity. The, the same density function, y n by 2 minus 1 over gamma n by 2. All right, so in general, it's very difficult to, uh, you have to do this uh, uh, numerically or incomplete integral. Uh, and a very simple, ca a special case where you get a closed form expression is when n equal to 2. So let's just do it for n equal to 2. So n equal to 2, you see, this becomes, uh, the limits are, of course, the same. Uh, this will go away. That's the important thing, right? n equal to 2, this is go away. This is 2. This is 1. So this is half e raised to minus y by 2 dy. So this is e raised to minus y by 2. 2, 2 cancels with a, min with a minus time, right? Uh, eta over sigma 1 squared to infinity. Top limit minus... Uh, of bottom limit, so that turns out to be what? Top limit is zero, minus minus goes away, so e raised to minus eta over sigma one squared, right? So again, for n equal to two, you do, it's exactly the same integral, a different, uh, uh, so this will run e raised to minus eta over sigma naught squared. All right, so right, so in this particular problem, at least you see that PD and PFR either goes up or comes down together, right? Because look at this is one. This is other, so you can see the relation between them. I'm going to show you pretty soon that this relation is pretty general. 
Any questions? Let me do one more problem quickly. Couple more problems, but at least let me do one more. Then I want to go into. You can see you need to uh, solve problems. That's when you will, uh, you know, you will consult the probability book and and fix up stuff. So let me start a problem that may not be there. I'll do halfway through and then you complete it. Okay. Uh, so, um, I'll show you the difficult steps, and then maybe you can go home and see whether, uh, how much you can simplify and uh, submit it along with the homework too. So you can pick up this as the, either the, let's say this is the uh, first problem in homework two, this one, or the last problem, I think problem number six. Okay, I see there are four problems, so I'm going to give you one more problem. So very similar to what we had last time. So this is a, a difficult problem, so So I'll, I'll solve you the difficult part, and then you just simplify. All right, so you will say this is, looks like an easy problem because this is already, we bent over a similar problem in in class, first problem that this is also solved in book, except things are in the details. What we solved was A, a was a constant. Now A is going to be a random variable. So I'll make it easy. So of course you can read it, right? A is a Gaussian random variable with a zero mean and some variance. All the noises are zero mean and equal variance. And all the noise components are given to be independent and identically distributed. So this data under hypothesis H0, are the, all the RIs are independent and identically distributed, right? So RIs, it's pretty clear, are IID under H0, right? Because RA is the same as NI, all the NIs are IID. Now look here, you have Gaussian and Gaussian. Let's also, I'm also going to give it to you that these random variables are independent. So a lot of independence going on. All these random variables are independent. This is independent of this. All right, so what we of course need to set up lambda R this is the joint density function of all the R1, R2, etc., Rn under H1 over joint density function of R1, R2, etc., Rn under H0. Anybody? So far, remember, we write it like this. So the denominator is clear. These are the, all the random variables are independent under H0. Ris, because Ris are the same as Ni. How about the numerator? Hello, I need you to give me some feedback. Uh, 
Oh, hold on. So my first question is, what do we do from here? Can I write it like this on the numerator? What? R1, R2, Rn, or? So if I write it here, you are saying this is the same as the product of the Ris, which means all the Ris are independent. Look at there. Are the Ris dependent or independent? R1 is A plus Ni. R2, A plus N2. Yes? The random variable R1 depends on the random variable A and noise. Random variable R2 depends on the same random variable A and noise. Suppose there was no noise. R is A, R is A. Dependent or independent? R, R1 and R2. Under hypothesis H1. Under H1. Remember, look at the problem that is given to you. Under, uh, under uh, when you collect the data, a is, uh, a is a random variable. A is present in all the data samples. But A is a random variable. So first thing you need to, remember, you are jumped, you are out of probability. So at this is a probability question. So you can try to, so look at what is the mean of, uh, so under H1 we are talking about. R1 is uh, expected value of a plus n1. So what is the mean of these random variables? Anybody? It's given to you, zero mean, right? So to see whether, so let's find out the correlation between R1 and R2. So you only need the expected value of, you just need to find out this, right? Because this is the, let's see the covariance divided by sigma 1, sigma 2 is the correlation, right? So this is expected value of A plus, you can do this, you don't have to do any guesswork, A plus N2. So, so this, of course, if I expand, you get A squared <coughs> plus expected value of A N1. Uh, what is A N1? A and N1 are independent. So this product is? Hmm? Yeah, say it louder, you're right, zero. zero. Because this is this multiplied by this, each are zero mean. So this is a n2, also zero. And expected value of n1, n2, zero or not? These are independent, zero. Remember, the lack of practice, that's why, and how about this, zero or no? Expected value of a squared, what is it? Sigma a squared, right? Because the mean is zero. So this is sigma a squared. My point is the correlation, look at this. This is the, cor this is the covariance between R1 and R2. That's the correlation between R1 and R2. The so correlation coefficient is not zero. That means R1 and R2 are correlated. So they cannot be independent, right? So it's a problem here because you cannot, this is not, this expression you cannot write it on the top. So what you said is true. You can convolve this with this, you will get all the, each Ri, but that doesn't give you the joint. You, you want the joint density function, I see. So generally, I give this as a homework problem for you to do it, but you can see. So if you, this is certainly not true. You cannot write this as the product because the, I just showed it. Uh, they are, so what do you do? Okay. Anybody, what do you do? How do you, what you said is, I can find the density function of Ri. That is true. Each Ri is, of course, Gaussian. Because look, I can argue like this, Gaussian plus Gaussian, whether they are dependent or independent is always Gaussian. The mean of this is the mean of some of the means is zero. So this is zero. And since they are independent, what is the variance of Ri? Anybody? Some of the variance. So that's sigma a squared. But this is not enough because, why is this not enough? Uh, because the, you don't, they are correlated, so you need to find out all the cross correlations. So it's a big mess. But still, we want to solve this problem. Uh, so the next question is: We know that all these Ri's are correlated or dependent. Uh, so the interesting question is then, what is the joint density function of R1, R2, etc.? Uh, so I'll write the answer. I did. I have brought up. 
I wrote some notes for you precisely on this one. I'm going to distribute it to you now. But let me write down the answer. So you take this vector r. Maybe you have seen this answer. Maybe you have not. Uh, so the, in this case, the mean is 0, right? So you have to look at the covariance matrix, which is r, r, r transpose. That means expected value of r1 squared, r1, r2, etc., r1, rn, r1, r2, r2 squared, etc. So these are the expected values on each term. So this will be rn squared. This is a positive definite matrix. So these entries are like this. Sigma 1 squared, this is rho 1, sigma 1, sigma, rho 1, 2, sigma 1, sigma 2. Remember, expected value, so this entry will be expected value of r i r j. So this will be sigma i, sigma j, rho i j. Again, why am I writing so quickly? You are supposed to know all this. Otherwise, please review it. Okay. So general, a general entry is here, as I said, a rho i j, sigma i, sigma j. And uh, then what? Then this joint density function is, I'm just, uh, let me call this to be a capital R, a covariance matrix. Uh, so this is, I'm going to give you the formula. And then you may ask why this is true. And instead of deriving everything in class, let me ask you to at least do some. So this is the determinant. I think there is a square root here. This is the inverse of the, this covariance matrix. So the last entry will be sigma n squared. This will be uh, rho 1 n, sigma 1, sigma n, etc. This is an n by n matrix. Now, why is this true? So I'm going to give you a proof. Uh, so I start with the something you know, which is the independent Gaussian random variables. And... Uh, and I end up with that derivation, right? So that you can check it at home. <coughs> so look at this problem by, <coughs> by insisting that this is also a Gaussian random variable. So that means in the previous problem, we are saying we know the amplitude. Here we are saying, I don't know, it could be uh, any value because it's a Gaussian random variable. But still we want, the, we want to simplify the LRT. So if you do the brute force, then you see the joint density function will be something like this. Now your next job will be to compute the R. It is not hard. You have already computed this. But then you have to plug in all these numbers. Then you have to take the inverse of that. It's a big mess. So I'm going to show you. You can do it this way. <coughs> but if you have uh, thought about this, you can also see that we can also solve this another way, which is a bit uh, easier. And uh, so what is that? See, I want the joint density function of R1, R2, et cetera, Rn under H1. We know that these are all uh, dependent random variables. They are not independent. Okay. Instead of writing like this, I'm just going to use R, OK? Uh, so of course, uh, this is true, right? So this is f of R given H1. Is this true? Hello? Hmm? <coughs> yes.
Yes? Why is that? See, remember, we have, if you know the joint density function of x and y, you can integrate out y, you get fx, right? So that's the same thing. I have, or I bring in one more variable and I integrate it out, okay? But a is goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. This a is, of course, the same a, okay? So I, why is this easier? Now remember, this also, of course, I can write this as integral f of x given y, f y y dy. I, I write it, I rewrite in terms of the conditional density function. Let's see. Remember, if you don't do this, your alternative is this, which is a big mess. So of course, I can. You don't have to worry about this. This we can. So this one we can also write this as integral f r given a. This is r multiplied by f a d a. But everything is under h1. So this is under h1. This is also under h1. So this is true, right? <coughs> now what? So if you look at uh, f of r given a under h1 is the same as f of r1, r2, etc., r and given a under h1. Now let's go back to r. R i's are here. See, A is given. Look at here. A is given. That means it's a given number. If it is a given number, R i's statistical behavior is the same as the noise. So the conditional density function of R given A is same as what? Noise. And they're all? That means the R i's on given A are independent random variables. So from looking at this problem, this is the same as, this is now the product of each R i given A and under H1. So this is the big step you wouldn't have made that I helped you to make it. So because A is like a number. A is given to you. A is like 2. So R A, so uh, give, uh, these, random, these dependent random variables, the conditional density functions are independent. But see, if R, this is easy because this is Gaussian. So the conditional density function of R A given A is what? Look at there. A is given. A is a number. So what is the mean of R A? Remember, we know another property. If R A's and A's are jointly Gaussian, the conditional density function also is Gaussian from probability. So these density functions are normal. So you only need two parameters. As you said, the mean is A because A is given. And the variance is? Sigma? Sigma what? Only because A is given. So A is not random. Randomness is dictated by noise. So it's only sigma n squared. All right, so I can substitute that here. So this reads, so this of course, you now if you want, we substitute. Uh, so this is 1 over 2 pi sigma n squared to the power n by 2. This, this is a bad notation, right? This is capital N, right? E raised to minus summation R i minus A, the whole square, over 2 sigma N squared, I equal to 1 through N, right? I took the product, I just simplified everything. So let me substitute it here. So this is 1 over 2 pi sigma N squared to the power n by 2, e raised to minus r i minus a. If anybody has problems, uh, stop me. Look here, I found this density function. Uh, these are not, in, these are dependent, whereas these are independent, and this is already given to us, right? FA, FA is also Gaussian, so that's going to be 1 over square root of 2 pi sigma a squared e raised to minus uh, a squared over 2 sigma a squared dA. Now you may say this is a mess, but if you look carefully, you can do this. Let me pull out all the constants. You go home and don't lose the constants. I'm just going to put this here as C, okay? All this, this constant, this constant, you have to, we, we will need to put it into the threshold. 
So you have 1 over 2 pi sigma m squared to the power n by 2, right? So integral goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. So look here, you expand here, you have three terms, here you have one term. So the integration is on A. So you have summation E raised to minus Ri squared over 2 sigma n squared, right? When I expand Ri squared, I just took it outside. Then you have integral. If you look inside, I have integral 2 sigma n squared, right? You have two terms, right? 2a summation Ri with a minus sign. So this becomes, uh, this is a minus. So there is a minus sign here. And plus summation n a squared, right? Minus, then you have this one, a squared over 2 sigma a squared. Right? This is in the, in the exponent, all this. I'll do a little more and then I want you to simplify. So if you look at the, this is, so the question is, let me just concentrate on this and show you how to simplify what that comes out to be. It looks like a mess, but not uh, really. So let me just look at this term, only the exponent. Okay. Then you can put it in the e to the power of that. All right, so we'll take this whole term. So this whole term now reads e raised to minus. I have a squared term, and then I have an a term. So what is the a squared term? a squared is 1 over 2. 1 over sigma a squared plus n over sigma n squared, right, a squared minus 2 over 2 sigma n squared a r i, right? Yes? I, I, a squared term, a squared here. I put it together. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let me hold on. So like this, isn't it? All right. You see, remember there is an integral here. We have the other. So let me. Okay, so this is integral e raised to. I suddenly see that I have a squared minus two a something. So I can write this as a minus something the whole squared, right? Remember, this is dA. So this is dA. So you see, uh, whatever it is, this term is what? So let's just write this up. So this is the same as, let me complete this. So this is sigma n. So this is All right, so that's that constant, right? So if I pull that constant outside, right? So sigma n squared plus n sigma a squared, sigma a squared, sigma n squared 2, then uh, this will become, this 2 goes outside. This term comes inside, cancels with, uh, sig, sig, so this is sigma a squared. Then there is an a here, sigma n squared, sigma plus n sigma a squared. Look what is happening. I have, look like a, another Gaussian random variable, right? And uh, so what is the variance? This is the, va this is the one over the variance. I can also write this as one over that quantity. So if you integrate a Gaussian random variable, what do you get? Remember, this is not quite true. There is, if you expand this, you get a squared. No, you are not paying attention. You have a squared, 
ARI. So this is sigma RI, right? Look at here, A squared. I'll write one more step. So to so I pull out that constant. So this is A squared. This is now minus 2ARI. What is it now? Sigma A squared over sigma n squared plus n sigma a squared a sigma ri. You see, this is the expansion of a minus b the whole squared. You have a minus b the whole squared is what? a squared minus 2 a b. So the rest is b plus b squared. So I can I can write this as a minus sigma a squared. over sigma n squared plus n sigma a squared summation ri the whole squared. But see, there is three terms here. So I take get rid of the last term, right? So this is the same as minus sigma a squared over. You need to do some work. So I'm not going to complete this 100%. This is true, right? Hello. See, if I have a squared minus 2ab, of course, I can write this as a minus b the whole squared minus b squared, right? That's what I have written down here. See, I have a squared minus 2a, the rest is b. So I can write this as minus 2a, this is b. So I can write it as a minus b the whole squared. So you have e raised to minus this whole quantity. Why am I doing all this? You see, if I integrate this on a, what do you get? Anybody? This is a Gaussian density function under a. Something, right? It's a constant. a is gone. So you collect all the ri squared terms together. So my point is, after doing all this, the numerator turns out to be some constant, you need to figure out what this constant is. See, so you have one term here, ri squared over 2 sigma n squared. Then you have e raised to minus some constant multiplied by ri the whole squared, right? That constant is this one, multiplied by this constant. So you figure out what this constant is. So the rest is easy. Now we got, look at here. So I'm going to substitute it here. So this is some constant here, e raised to minus summation ri squared over 2 sigma n squared. And then e raised to minus some other constant, c naught, summation ri the whole squared. And the denominator is, as I said, that's easy. It is e raised to minus ri squared over 2 sigma n squared constant. So this cancels with this piece, giving our LRT to be from this side. So your job is to figure out this and clean it up. So I guess, I hope you see that the LRT is actually remember there is a constant here. If, under, if this constant is positive, I can take it so assuming that being the case, it comes out to be like this, or remember sigma ri can be positive or negative. So either you can write it like this, or of course you can write it. And now of course you can uh, remember this is, if these are Gaussian, absolute value of the Gaussian is Rayleigh. So you can compute the probability of false alarm and probability of detection, etc. See the details. Details are important. Otherwise, uh, you could walk out in five minutes. Right? Any questions here? So remember, uh, I hope I haven't made any mistakes. But go home and check it out, and uh, multiply this constant with this constant, and uh, see. So you could submit. I've already done more than the key part is here. Simplify and what the likelihood function is, and see whether you can compute PD and PF. 
Any questions on this? Remember, I don't know the answer. Uh, you can make a slight uh, uh, modification to this problem. Everything is the same as I, I gave you before. Let's say the noise or IID. The noises. But A, if you want, you make a little, uh, you put a constant mean different from zero. The procedure is exactly the same, but you get a few more terms. And I think the, the final function, this will be different. That's what I want you to find out what it is. So if you want to solve something by yourself, you can try this problem. Uh, so my point is to do this right correctly, you need to uh, review probability, which is fine. Generally, it's a good idea to study when you need it. So now you need it, you go back and check the book. And uh, so where will this, so this is like the submarine problem. See, you have a signal. You, if you have a signal, you have no idea about its parameters and the noise. So you are not transmitting the signal. If you had transmitting, you would know the parameters, right? So it's like a fan noise or something. Right? Not only that, even if you know it is a fan, depending on the location of the fan, orientation, etc., the amplitude is going to be unknown. Unknown, and uh, it could take any value, which is the same as saying that's a random variable with some distribution. Right? So I made it easy for you by saying it is Gaussian. It may not be Gaussian. So Gaussian and this is Gaussian. Remember, if these two are independent, then of course independent Gaussians are Gaussian. Even if they are dependent, that's also Gaussian, but then you have to worry about their correlation. There is no correlation between these two. Remember, don't mistake me. I'm not saying there is any correlation between these two. I'm saying that the data is now correlated because the same random variable is hitting. What it means is, the, look, the fan is rotating, so I have no idea what amplitude I am going to receive. But once I get that amplitude, that amplitude is the same all through all the observations. Another way to put it is, the variation of this signal is much slower compared to the variation of the noise. Does that make sense? Right. A signal could be slowly varying, right? So it's still varying, but by the, by the time you collect the observation, this hasn't changed, whereas the noise has changed. Consequently, under H1, the data are dependent because of the signal part. So we have seen that LRT is optimal under Minimizing risk, which is the base uh, rule or criterion. And uh, LRT or log likelihood ratio is also uh, equal, uh, it's just one and the same thing. So generally the lambda R turns out to be Uh, so this is what the likelihood function, what was it? Is it? Hmm? This is for Owen? One zero minus? One zero zero. All right. P zero here, right? That's P zero. This is P one. 
as I said, uh, at least all the cost functions are subjective. That means uh, human intervention, right? You need to, so at least you can say that this is not a desirable, especially this part is not desirable. And uh, the question is, uh, how do we stay away from uh, bringing us into the problem? You are bringing yourself into the problem because you may set up this as one, zero, Somebody else may set this as uh, two and uh, one, etc. Right. So even if you say PD is uh, so much, it has no meaning because everything depends on the cost functions, which are subjective. Right. So your PD is not the same as the PD on for these people. Right. right. So it's well and good. You can PD, of course, is. Uh, But the trouble is the threshold is depending on uh, is uh, has human intervention interference right uh, so Newman Pearson I guess the these two people and probably a lot of other people they have been uh, uh, um, approach is slightly different. Stay away from all these subjective, uh, same detection problem, but there the philosophy is uh, you, you, what is probability of false alarm? Deciding in favor of H1 when H0 is true, right? So this is like the, even in the uh, Quantum mechanics, uh, the, this principle is there. You stay around with observables, things which you are, which you can see. So things which are under your control and which you can see are PD and PF. So these things are simply subjective and not under your control. So Neiman Pearson approach is, uh, what is generally you want PF to be low and PD to be high. So say what is acceptable, fix uh, a PF. So let's say PF should be less than or equal to alpha. Alpha might be something like 10 to the power minus 5 or whatever. <laughs> so that's the Newman-Pearson approach. You fix uh, the quantity uh, of quantities are PD and PF. One of them set a limit on what you can tolerate, and uh, so that's the, that's the condition I have put up. PF should be uh, less than or equal to a certain. Goal. So you can you can tolerate PF up to that alpha. Under that condition. You, you maximize the PD, which is the same as minimizing the uh, PM. Right? So Newman Pearson approach leads to So nothing subjective here. Of course, the only thing subjective is this, alpha. Uh, so, of course, uh, PD is 1 minus PM. So, this is the same as uh, minimizing the PM subject to uh, PF, of course, less than or equal to alpha. So, remember, PM is uh, probability of miss. Uh, that means deciding H0 when H1 is true uh, subject to Uh, PF, which is a probability of false alarm, H1, when H0 is true, that you want to be less than alpha. So if you know uh, how this way to solve this problem, this is a constrained optimization problem. Your goal is to minimize, minimize an objective function. This is your objective function subject to a condition. So 
maybe you have seen optimization theory, otherwise this goes like this. So your PM, you bring in a Lagrange constraint and uh, bring in the constraint also. So this is the constraint optimization problem. So you want to minimize this subject to this condition. So it's a, a PF, subject to PF is less than or equal to alpha. That means PF up to alpha is okay, right? PF is, uh, so now if I write down, remember what is uh, PM? PM is written here. So this is probability of R given H1 uh, under Z naught, right? plus lambda, and PF is joint density function of R give under H naught under C1. Right? All right, so you see this in either way, this integral can be written as 1 minus the same integral on Z naught, right? So let me put this uh, together on the top. So here you get, uh, I mean, this is a bad notation. This uh, Instead of lambda, let me put something else. Okay. Because lambda we have already used for the LRT. Capital lambda is used here, right? So this is just a, uh, a Lagrange modifier. Uh, this is this is an optimization. Uh, this is the optimization problem. It's the, and this is the constraint. So this is the objective function. We want to uh, minimize this. So this is the modified objective function, right? So that's the modified objective function. This is the Lagrange multiplier. That is not a, uh, this is not a threshold or anything. Lagrange multiplier. So the whole thing is a constrained optimization problem. You must have seen this, a very simple problem. So the W turns out to be here, right? I have a constant which is, uh, so what is it? Lambda into 1 minus alpha. That's a positive. Remember, alpha is less than 1. Alpha is a probability of false alarm. So that certainly is way smaller than 1. So that's positive. This whole thing is positive. Then if I put everything together, it now reads like this, right? So again, remember, we have no cost, no risk minimization, nothing. We are just minimizing the observable. Observable is false alarm. I'm sorry, probability of miss and false alarm. So one of them is kept as, uh, is held at uh, whatever you can tolerate. So the, to start with, I'm saying I can tolerate 10 to the power minus 5 of false alarm. But if you say, look, that is too high for me, then change it. Whatever it is, you come up with some value. Okay. All right, so you see, we want to minimize this. So again, you have uh, one number here, could be positive or negative. So let me write uh, two cases. So as before, if this quantity is smaller than this, this whole thing will be negative. If uh, Then this integral will be negative. And that means you are subtracting from a positive quantity, which is what we want to do when you minimize it. That means that particular R should be declared in Z naught. If this condition is satisfied, you want this R to be in Z naught, or that's the same as saying that you decide in favor of H naught. 
If this quantity is greater than this, that's positive, and you don't want to put that R in Z0. That R should be in Z1. That means when this is greater than this, you declare in terms of H1. What is it? But look at this. This also I can write this as FR under H1 over FR under H0. Is if it is uh, greater than lambda, you declare in favor of H1. If it is less than lambda, declare in favor of H0. What is this? What is the difference between this and what we started with? Same. So interesting thing is we complete we changed our criterion. We used a new point of view. What is the point of view? Is that let me fix PF and try to minimize or maximize the PD. You end up with the same function. This reinforces that the original basic idea is a good one because the, you get the same result. So once again, LRT is optimal. Also because this is Newman-Pearson criterion, that is a fixed uh, probability of false alarm and minimize PM or maximize PD, you come up with, so there is no difference between this and uh, mathematically, uh, the end result is the same. LRT is again optimum. Uh, so of course, since it's the same ratio, this will be the same lambda R or LR. Okay. So this, uh, you may come up with something like this again. So what is this lambda? Of course, in the Lagrange parameter need to be modified. So remember, how do you find? Lambda is unknown here. It looks like it is a threshold, but we have no cost and etc. So how do you find a lambda? Anyone? <coughs> how do you find lambda? Right, because look, something is given to us. It's uh, subject to, you have a constraint. PF cannot exceed this. So let's find out PF. PF is, of course, probability of declaring in favor of H1 when H0 is true. This, this will only happen if L is greater than lambda when H0 is true. So this is the integral of L under H0, but L going from lambda to infinity. The max, this has to be less than or equal to alpha. Alpha, alpha is given, so solve for lambda. So lambda will turn out to be something. So use the, uh, so if you, uh, you fix your alpha at whatever level, that will give you, so uh, this you fix it to be some alpha naught, which is less than or equal to alpha. Then, then once you fix alpha naught, you can solve for lambda, right? So you, of course alpha naught, if you, the, the maximum value you can allow it to be is uh, alpha, right? So that will give you lambda, then the problem is completely solved. PF is already here, then you solve for PD. Here of course lambda is known. Uh, here you solve for lambda, so you lambda obtain, you can get PD and PF. Any questions? Otherwise, uh, so that's the Newman Pearson approach. So, in summary, we have we have two methods now, right? One is base risk minimization, where you set up cost for each action and find the overall cost or risk and minimize it. That leads to log, li I mean likelihood, fun uh, likelihood ratio test is the optimum there. All right, so that's one approach. The second approach is the Newman-Pearson method where you don't talk about the cost, you, you talk about what is the probability of false alarm you can tolerate 
and then try to maximize the probability of detection or minimize the probability of miss. Now, interestingly, mathematically, you get exactly the same result as base because you get the LRT as the op optimum. So this actually reinforces the importance of LRT, log, I mean, likelihood ratio test is the right thing to do in the case of detection. There is only one thing to do, which is the likelihood ratio test. That's optimum. So this is optimum yeah, under uh, two, two condi uh, case. So one is, it's, even if you come from base, uh, risk minimization of course this involves the cost and so on you get that one or if you come from from the Newman Pearson test with the P of health and uh, minimization of the maximization of the probability of detection you come up with the same formulation simply showing the importance of uh, this, uh, the test. So Newman-Pearson test leads to log likelihood ratio, uh, likelihood ratio test. Uh, Bayes risk minimization also leads to exactly the same test. And uh, test usually you can simplify and bring it into this form. Uh, this we talk about the sufficient statistics. So let me talk to you about a little bit more about the sufficient statistics. Then we may conclude the lecture with uh, a simple case of Emery that we can deal with. So if you want, you can put your homework here, pick up a homework solution, pick up homework two, and then I have some one other, uh, something else I wrote up. What is it? So, yeah, I do have some notes on sufficient statistics also. So pick that up too, which I'm going to go over with you now. So, so let me put it here. So I'm going to uh, start the class in a couple of minutes. Look here, I'm uh, going to give you some uh, information which is not there in the book. So of course the book also talks about sufficient statistics. I want to make it clear this is in the context of detection because when we come up to, you can read the notes afterwards when uh, at home. When we come to estimation, we again come up with this uh, concept maybe in a slightly, uh, with a, in a broader sense. But here it literally, remember, you, you take the LRT, likelihood ratio test. Uh, first of all, uh, this side is positive because it's the ratio of two density functions, right? So positive, this is a positive function. And, but the interesting thing is this is going, to, whatever it is going to be a complicated function of data, right? That's why I write it like this. It's a single function because this is a scalar. R is not a scalar, R is a vector. But the joint density function is a scalar function divided by another scalar function. So you get one function of data. It could be sigma ri squared plus ri, et cetera, et cetera. But nevertheless, it's one function of this. So of course, it literally says this function is sufficient to decide between these two hypotheses, right? Because if this function exceeds gamma, you decide in favor of H0. And if it is less than gamma, you decide in favor of H0. So we can either stop here or let me push it a little more. Okay. So this being a function of data, another way to look at it is that take the whole uh, data. So this, this spans a vector space, right? Like that, you have R1, R2, whatever, R, K, R, N. So this is an n-dimensional vector space. Let me remember, any vector space you can also have, that's, that's one set of bases. I can have another set of bases, right? For example, this may be uh, another, see, uh, another set of bases, right? 
So I'm going to, um, uh, so what is an example? An example will be like this, right? This is XY coordinate system. Right? Of course, I can also, uh, a point here, I needed two coordinates, but I can also write it in this coordinate system, right? So this is x1, y1. This is just a rotated. Right? And this one here, I'm purposely, I'm going to make the first coordinate L. So remember, this is a data. This is a function of the data. So the other ones, everything is going to be functions of data. I'm going to call it y. So this is another, uh, this, everything is a function of the data, right? I'm just rearranging. For example, here, x1 is x plus y by 2, and I think this is x minus, minus x plus y by 2, right? Uh, so everything is a function of data, just rearranged. Uh, so you see, joint density function of R under H1, of course I can write it as joint density function of L and Y under H1, right? This whole thing I'm going to call it as y, y vector. Y is an n minus one dimensional vector. Any questions? This is clear, right? So divided by, so this is your gamma or, this is what I'm going to call the sufficient statistics, L. So this is R under H naught. So this is F L comma y under h naught. Now remember, you, you know this rule, right? Density function of x comma y is the same as x given y multiplied by f y. So of course, the numerator I can write it as f l, f l given y, right? You have two ra random variables. The second one is actually a, a, a n minus one tuple, but both under h one. So this is uh, true, right? Remember, the, all these are different functions. So this is L under H naught multiplied by L, uh, L given you know, the other way. Hello? If you take out uh, Y, so if you want to write this as Fx, then this is y given x, right? Right? So if I want to take out L out, so if you write it like this. So if I want to write it as FL, then this should be y given L, right? So everything is under H1. So here also it says y under L comma H naught, right? <laughs> but look at what it says here. See, uh, the, this is all, the, when you do all the simplification, this is only a function of L. Uh, so this has to cancel out, isn't it? There cannot be any y, because look at here, after I cancel everything, it is a function, just L. So there is no y. That means these two density functions must cancel out. So this implies we have these relations. We have, interestingly, L equals F of L under H1 over F of, remember, everything is a function of R, H0. And more importantly, or equally importantly, uh, the density function of y1 through yn minus 1, given L under h1, is the same as the density function of all those random variables. So let's try to make sense of what I'm, this says, these random, remember there is, this is, everything is function of data. This is a different coordinate system. Uh, these random variables, look at there, they are joint density, but conditioned on, on the fact that L is given, if L is given, under the two hypotheses, they are identical. The joint density function of these random variables 
is indistinguishable whether under H0 and H1 are same. That statement is not true, given L. So it says that conditional density function of, I am not saying, I have two random variables, Y under, I am not saying this is true. I am not saying these random variables have the same density function under the two hypotheses. These random variables given L has the same. So this is why given L are identical under the two hypotheses. So L is the key. If you extract L out of the data, there is nothing more. The other random variables look the same under the, they have no information. Look, these random variables given L has no information about the hypothesis. It is on a, under both the hypothesis, they look exactly identical. Consequently, these random variables are called nuisance random variables. They, they do not serve any purpose. Nuisance parameters. So the key is this relation. <laughs> they have, the L also has this strange property and we will exploit. So this is the same as saying that F L under H1 is the same as L multiplied by F L under H0. I hope you understood the argument, right? So we keep L. Remember you have seen a lot of, uh, hello, if, you, if I give you one set of coordinates, you know how to make it orthonormal, for example, right? Go through uh, or the ortho, uh, Gram-Smith uh, procedure, right? So this is something similar. It's not exactly Gram-Smith. We use this and synthesize first coordinate. Then let's say the second coordinate is chosen orthogonal to this, and the third is orthogonal to these two and so on, whichever way. But whatever you do, these parameters, what we have just shown is these parameters have no information about the hypothesis. Why is that? Look here. Uh, given L, given L, all these random variables under the two hypotheses look exactly the same. The conditional density functions. L is crucial. L, L extracts everything about the two hypotheses from the data and the remaining thing is like uh, waste. It has no information. So they are nuisance parameters. All right, let me show you, let me use these expressions to make, uh, show you the relation between PD and PF. <coughs> Before you go, I'll tell you what to read up uh, the Next week, I am going to start the estimation actually, but estimation will take a longer time and I will start with the uh, random parameter estimation. You had a question? You were clear? So we want to compute uh, these quantities. So this probability of uh, detection is what? Detecting in favor of H1 when H1 is true. This is when L exceeds gamma under H1, right? And the PF is uh, detecting in favor of H1 when H0 is true. This is also well in, when L exceeds gamma. Remember, L is a function of R when H0 is true. This is the same as gamma to infinity F of L given H1 DL. Uh, this is gamma to gamma or eta, whatever I used. Let's stick with uh, gamma now. Right. So L exceeds gamma, you or uh, gamma, we decide in favor of H1, right? All right, so I want to show that uh, the characteristics of PD and PF are like this. This is a classic relation. It is convex up PD. So it's not like this. 
that means if it is like this, if the derivative is positive, derivative is negative. Here, the derivative is always like this. Moreover, there is no maximum. If there is a maximum, the derivative will be uh, uh, what? The rate of change of derivative is going to be zero. That means so I'm going to show that if it is concave up, the second derivative is also of unique sign. So first I want to show that dpd by dpf is positive, and I'm also going to show that means the curve is uh, not like this, but concave up like this because of the second condition. Otherwise, it could be like this. Right? This is like a part of a hat. Any problem, first problem, second problem, all the problems, once we prove this, it will be. So you see, this is my own proof. So I guess we don't need this. So you know the, uh, the, you know the uh, physical meaning of L. L extracts from the data, L extracts everything about the problem. Even worse, what is remaining has no information. You can see because their joint density function is exactly the same under the other two hypotheses. So the way I'm going to do this is, I'm going to use this partial derivative, I mean, this derivative rule. Right, this is true, yes? Oh, so let's do each of them because you have, so this is where the formula I gave you last time will be helpful. So let me write down that formula one more time. So if you have a function like this, then we want dgx by dx. The uh, only reason is, look at here, gamma is in the, in the, in the limits, so, which is the case here also. So remember, it's the derivative of the top limit. Then whatever is the variable of integration, you substitute the top limit. Minus the derivative of the bottom limit. This is Laplace's rule. You can check any book you, uh, on differentiation. Or you can do it yourself. I have some notes also. Let me see if I can dig it out. I'll give it to you. And substitute the bottom limit uh, at, this, at the variable location. Minus or plus, you keep the limits as they are. And uh, what do you do generally, which is this. Take the derivative of this with respect to x. Of course, if the limits are constant, this term is gone, this term is gone, you are used to this. Okay. So let's apply this to find out dPd by uh, Pd by P gamma. So dPd by D gamma. Look here. Top, top limit is constant. So the derivative of the top limit is 0. Bottom limit is gamma itself. Derivative is 1. So it's minus 1. Uh, then variable, variable is this. In the variable, you substitute the limit. So what do you get? Huh? F of given H1, right? And the third term is keep the limits as take the derivative of this with respect to gamma. Zero. So there is nothing else. So that's the answer here. Okay, simple enough. And dPf over d gamma. Hello. Is the same thing here, right? Derivative of the top limit is zero minus the derivative of the bottom limit, 1. Substitute uh, uh, the lower limit into L. So that's minus f of gamma given 
Evet. And then what? And then, yeah, then you divide this, right? So this is L, right? <coughs> so let me divide this. So I divide this. So this I get F of gamma given H1 over F of gamma given H0. This F, again, let me not, uh, Remember, we are talking about the F for L. This is not, remember, this F is not the same as this F, I hope you, so I'm going to call this F22. It's a different F. Because this is F1, this is F0, this will be some other F. This is the density function of this. So everything is not the same. So if you want, you can call this F3, this is F4, whatever, right? So it's a different F. This density, I mean, this is fine, not, yeah, here also, same thing. This density function is uh, uh, a function of n random variables, whereas this is one random variable, which is L. This may be chi-squared, this may be Gaussian, so they are not the same. Again, I'm just using, the no, because otherwise, we have already dealt with 50 Fs, I don't want to keep track. You just look inside. So this f, of course, corresponds to whatever was the random variable here. That random variable was L. So we just substituted instead of L. If this was Gaussian, this is the Gaussian with this value evaluated, right? This is just a number. But look at here. So this is your F3 and this is your F4. Because this f is from here, this f is from here. So, and then I substituted. So you have so what happens if you substitute L into gamma, what do you get? Gamma, okay, so here you get, or anyway, at this point you can see that this is positive, right? So we proved the first quantity. We proved that uh, this is positive. And to do the second one, now I need d squared PD over uh, dpf uh, squared, so that's that's the same as d by dpf. You can do it yourself. dpd by dpf. This is the same as. One over. So. So, of course, I can write this as uh, dpf. Over d gamma, right? Yeah, dpf, dpf cancels, you get... Uh, I mean, so this will be what? d gamma over dpf, right? D gamma cancels, right? But this is the same as 1 over uh, dpf over. This is what I meant, right? This is gamma, not r. Now, what is this quantity? Anybody? This is 1 because look at here. Uh, dpd by dpf, we just concluded this is gamma, right? Why is this gamma? Look here. If you substitute here gamma, gamma, you get gamma. So L is very strange. L has this properties. Okay. You don't need any of this. This is only in case you get confused. Okay. And dpf by d gamma is already here, somewhere here, right? So this is this is one, this is. All right, so the whole answer comes out to be minus f of gamma. But remember, a density function is positive, so this quantity is certainly negative, right? Huh? Oh, one over, right, you're right. So one over this. But uh, so it's still a positive. I'm sorry, negative, which is what we wanted to prove. So without a question, we showed that the function is has positive slope and this. Derivative of the slope is negative, so it's, it has to go like this. 
not like this. All, all ROCs, any problem, we operate, which if it is coming from an LRT, the operating characteristics. So if you do a receiver and your operating characteristics doesn't look this way, then you made mistakes. So remember, this is PD, this is PF. So if you have two curves like this, which one is better? Look at here, for the same PF, so you fix PF naught, you are getting higher PD, right? So sometimes, you know, you can show that with the signal to noise ratio going up, the curve goes this way and so on. So you can plot it for various uh, parameters, whatever you have. So in Vantries, you will see curves like this for worked out. So we already, uh, so this is a general, uh, we have solved for all problems, but specific problems we already remember for the different variants uh, that example number two, I already showed the relation between PD and PF. This doesn't tell us the exact relation, but it shows <coughs> the general rule. DPD by DEPF, the slope is always positive and the derivative of the slope is uh, negative. Any questions on this? So remember, I, I needed the sufficient statistic to get this key relation. Think about this. So whatever, look at what it says. This, what you start with the joint density functions, take its uh, simplest form, don't take logarithm or something, whatever it is, Call that L. It only involves the data. <coughs> so in your case, this may be E raised to minus some constant, sigma R raised, etc. So this is what I'm going to call L. Not this, this one. This is a function of data. It's just a one variable, right? And this is, a, this is certainly a random variable. This random variable has the property that if you take this random variable, it's crazy yeah, that find it's a density function under the two hypotheses and divide, you will get back L. That's also another property of the, so that's what I wanted to show you. Of course, you can simplify this further, but then this, uh, this is not the, I mean, simplest form of data is here, but if you want this property, that we are referring to this one. When you simplify whatever you get, you call it L. Because look here, this L, if you want it to be equal to this, equal to this over this, uh, then that need to be the density functions of uh, these, ran these random variables. So what we have shown is this, F6 and F7 are identical. And uh, these random, the, if you take their ratio, you get back the same L. That's generally not true. You take a random variable under two hypotheses, take the ratio, you are, going, you are not going to get back the same random variable, only for this particular L. And we exploited that to find out all this uh, uh, DPD by DPF. We have a little bit of time, so let me show you, uh, do a little bit more on what I was planning to do on Emery hypothesis and uh, I'll bring you some notes next week on that. So I think whatever I talked about now, I gave you already the notes, right? Sufficient statistics. Any questions? Anyone? Uh, so hopefully they will give us the video within few days. So I'll, I think it will be posted on, uh, and you will have access. So you can, uh, from Blackboard, you can look at it and uh, review it if you want to go over something. Right.
you can write it as h0 through hm minus 1 or simply call it uh, ec. <coughs> so again, the you compute the risk r is, what is it, double summation cij probability of deciding in favor of hi given hj, that's this cost multiplied by probability of hj, right? i equal to 1 through m, j equal to 1 through m. Uh, minimize this risk over picking up, that's uh, picking up the partitions. So just to notational convenience, I'm going to call this uh, pj. So this is the same as, uh, maybe we'll write it here. So this is the same, I'm going to write this as two terms. C, <coughs> right, this is true, is it? Uh, how do you justify this? Given HJ, you have to decide uh, one of them, right? So this is always true, right, probability of hi given hj i equal to 1 through m is of course 1. So then you get this relation. Okay. So this of course I can write this as uh, uh, cj. So let's say j equal to 1 through m p of hj given hj pj and then summation j equal to 1 through m, i naught equal to j, c i j, right? p h i given h j multiplied by p j. Isn't this true? So let me, let me substitute for this what I have here. So use this here. So let me call this one. So bring in one here. Okay. Use one here. Okay. So this will be, of course, a C J J, a P J, right? J plus summation. j1 equal to m, that's common, so this is i not equal to j, right, cij minus cjj, isn't it true? Just to plug it in, right, so this much is true, right, uh, oh, this one I already took out here, this minus cjj, right, cjj, this will be with the minus sign, so that much is true. So if you want, you can write this as uh, sigma rather than waste all this space. Let me put it this way. So let me take this uh, up here. So this is equal to summation pj cjj uh, plus look here I'm going to do a trick i not equal to j right that's correct right because here you need i not equal to j what happens even if I put i equal to j, what happens? Zero. So you see, this is true, but this is also true. I, I don't have, even if I put i equal to j, that's not going to contribute anything. Because i equal to j, this becomes cjj minus c, that term is zero. So I can actually write it like this. So you can write it in the next line. This is the same as having it as same expression, i not equal to j. Okay. 
So I'm going to uh, rewrite this as risk equals, let me use a different color. So that's just a minor observation, sir. So I'm going to put everything together. So this is PJ, CJG, which is not interesting because that's just a constant. What is interesting is this term. And I'm going to pull I equal to one outside. So then I'm going to pull this outside and write this as uh, CIJ. I'm going to keep everything the same, right? Remember, even if I is not equal to J, it's not going to contribute to anything. And uh, this, of course, you know the term, right? This is integral of F R given H J and decide in favor of Z i's, right? That's what this is. This term is integral F R given H J D R deciding in favor of Z i D R. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, multiplied by PJ. So you put a PJ here. This one? Uh, the, the, that chair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, there is a PJ here, right? Now concentrate here. That's summed up on J, right? And uh, so this is a function of what? What index should I put here? Hmm? Right, definitely I. So the risk is, of course, I can write it as I equal to 1 through M. Remember, this is one term by itself. So dummy index CII plus summation I equal to. This is immaterial. This is just a constant. But the key is here. OK, now comes the punchline. Look at here. The question was, an R is here. Which hypothesis should I attribute it to, right? In what? This symbol? I want to use something. You don't like that symbol? I'll put something else. I mean, I need a symbol here, right? What do you want to put? Give me a symbol then. You don't like, uh, yeah, it's not the likelihood function or anything. All right, yes, maybe. OK. Fine. So what is uh, SI, right? What is SI again? So SI is uh, your, the summation j equal to 1 through m pj cij minus cjj multiplied by zi f r given h j a d r so you don't you you can compute this for i equal to 1 through m right so you compute this for each r so this is the instructions compute uh, si for each i and then what do you do so of course, this is going to be a positive number. Look here. This is positive. This is positive. This is positive. You're going to get m positive numbers. One of them is going to be smallest. For a particular i, it will be smallest. So you, remember, you're trying to minimize the risk. So you know what the rest of the story. If you want to minimize the risk, the question was, where should I put that r? The answer is obvious. I should put that r into that particular i for which this quantity is minimum. Right? This is the procedure, right? R goes to ZK or HK if uh, hypothesis HK is true, if SK happens to be the minimum among those, these M numbers, right? All right, so that's the end of the MRE in general. I, I hope you understand. I'm going to do a couple of special cases. It'll only take a few minutes, then we can quit. Punchline is here. 
you compute this, these quantities are all positive because look, this is positive, this is positive. This is of course assuming the cost for a wrong decision is higher than the cost for the right decision. This is positive. So you compute, what about J? There is no J. J is just, uh, it's a summation, it goes away. So this is only a function of I because I is here, I is here. And uh, uh, so you have, <coughs> once you have, uh, once you have computed this, uh, uh, you will get, uh, as I said, m numbers, and one of them, the smallest one, will be, will be the right one because the risk is going to get minimized. Okay. So let's do a special case. Let's say C i i is zero and C i j is one i not equal to j, the communication case, right? Then you see lambda i will turn out to be look here, i equal to j it is zero, right? I equal to j it, j is zero. So this is j not equal to i. Oh, hold on, maybe. So what I'm, uh, maybe a small, uh, let me, let me, this is even, uh, let me put that integral here, okay, zi. So what I'm calling as si is without the integration. So this is what I'm calling si. That makes a sense, forgive me. Because you have the, uh, you have the density functions of the hj's, so the, remember, otherwise it will be like a catch-22. You don't know what is ZI, which is what we are trying to figure out. So call, call SI is to be this quantity inside. In other words, SI is this quantity, which can be, there is no DR, which can be computed. One of them is going to be minimum. So if, if this turns out to be minimum for a particular SK, then that particular R goes to ZK. That's the algorithm. R goes to ZK, ZK was correct, and that's the algorithm. So the key is you are only computing known quantities. You see, this is this you can compute. ZI, of course, if I knew the index, if I knew the region, I can integrate. I don't know. That's what I'm trying to find out. So R, the question is, this R should go to which ZI? The answer is here. Compute the inside quantity, which is just this, with the summation. With this summation, you can compute it. It will be minimum for one particular i, call it k. Then that r, sh r should belong to zk. That's the same as saying that hypothesis hk is true, right? In that case. All right, so in this case, this is turn going to turn out to be, <coughs> look at here. I'm going to, so I'm going to write it from here. If r given hj, multiplied by probability of hj, which is this. And this is one, right? And let me, let me just divide by a, co a constant. This is not a function, this is just like a constant. I'm dividing by, I'm dividing by <coughs> just a, a number which is independent of i and j. So of course, look at the right side. Now this is, Uh, base rule, right? What is this? Anybody? What is this quantity? Or uh, not probability? Density function of right? So this is uh, what did you say? All right, so this is known as the a priori, a priori, right? Probability. Uh, this is known as the 
a posteriori. That's only, it's only, this is a discrete random variable. So this is just going to be a probability. So a posteriori probability. For hypothesis Hj, so remember, initially you may say that probability is half, or all of them are equally likely. What, it's, what is this probability? You, you have the data. Data is the king or the queen in your case. Right? So you need to use the data to recompute these probabilities of this. How likely is this hypothesis? So this is the same as i equal to 1 through m, but i not equal to j, right? That's what we had before. So isn't this the same as 1 minus probability of hj given r, right? What is the, hold on, what is the summation on? Summation is on j, right? Remember, I'm talking about here. The summation is on j. So this is j1 one, one equal to m, j not equal to y. Look at here. When j equal to y, this is 0. That's the reason we didn't put the j not. Here also I could have put j not equal to y. It's understood here. So here the summation is on j. So this is the same as uh, hi, right? So this is the same as hi here, right? OK. Uh, under any data, one of the hypotheses has to be true. So probability of H1 given R plus H2 given R, etc. HM given R is 1. So this one, J not equal to I is the same as 1 minus probability of HI given R. Okay. So remember, the, look at the choice. Previously, we were going to, uh, we were going to pick up, compute all this. Yes, this is your SI. So we were going to pick up SI with the lowest value, right? Minimum value. That is the same as saying you pick up the hypothesis corresponding to. Remember, you compute each SI, I equal to 1 through M, which means you compute this and choose the minimum of this. That's the same as maximum. maximum. So the MRE hypothesis uh, uh, in this in this special case, otherwise this is the general MRE rule. In the special case, when you, we have these cost functions, the maximum a posteriori uh, probability is the is the right decision. In other words. You have the prior probabilities. Look at the, OK? Then the data comes in. You compute the, uh, the post. <coughs> this is the a priori probabilities. The data comes in. Recompute the probabilities of the same hypothesis under the data. These are the a posteriori probabilities, right? i equal to 1 through m. Then what? Remember, these are probabilities. So what happens? One of the numbers will be? largest unless there is a tie or something. Then what it says is the right detection is choose the hypothesis which, is, uh, which has maximum probability. That is the most likely. Remember, you can say heuristically that makes sense. That's not the point. We just proved that the. So the question is, what does the data dictate? These are the a priori probabilities. Maybe all of them are equal. You could say that. Then the data comes in. You recompute these probabilities. Now it may look like this. So these are the new probabilities of HI uh, given the data. So of course, this is the maximum. So you say that H2 is true here. Or if this is K, you say HK is true. So the rule is what? 
rule is uh, select the hypothesis which, uh, which has the maximum a posteriori probability. So to summarize somewhere here, I'll write the, I will just rewrite what I just said. So in communication, the, uh, this is the generally the cost function you use, which is Cij is uh, zero if i equal to j. So if Cij is uh, one i not equal to j, and zero if i equal to j, then you have the a posteriori probabilities. Data comes in, then you compute the a priori probabilities. And then you compute the a posteriori probabilities. And the maximum of the a posteriori probabilities gives the uh, HK, correct hypothesis. So select the hypothesis corresponding to the maximum a posteriori probability. And in that case, if you want the cost function, of course, you resubstitute it here put all the CIJs equal to 1. This is 0, so you simply get uh, see all the CIJs or uh, right? So this will turn out to be summation, summation, PJ. PJ, this is 1, so it's simply probability of HI given HJ. Here, I not equal to J, right? Here, this is, of course, as I said, I not equal to J is understood here because when I equal to J, that term goes away. And uh, and this is uh, this is also probability of error. So you need to put the PJs. This is all different probabilities of error. And uh, so that's the expression. So this is, in this special case for the MRA hypothesis testing, you recompute the a posteriori probabilities under the data, then pick the one with the maximum, uh, the, that hypothesis which gives you the maximum probability. Uh, so then you, you are saying that that data is detected as HK if HK happens to have the largest value <coughs> among all this. So you compute this for I equal to 1 through M and pick uh, maximum. That will be HK. So a situation might be that to start with you have equally likely hypothesis. So this is your PHIs to start with. That will be this. So this is 1, 2, et cetera, M. Then when we recompute that numerically, you got these values. So this is, of course, the a posteriori probabilities of HI given data and then here of course you say that this is the right hypothesis okay all right I'll write this up and uh, give it to you uh, this is I think this is there in the one of the references Weyland and McDonough but you can see when you have more than two hypotheses you, you need to do more work it gets to be more complicated but the, the easiest case is if you are willing to make this assumption, uh, then the test is easy. You just need to recompute, uh, you need to recompute uh, M probabilities of the hypothesis uh, given data. So once again, you can see the importance of the conditional density function. How do you compute this? Uh, the, the way you compute this is using this formula. Right? So remember, Finally, this, this is the same as 
So the way you will compute it, you will do R given HI multiplied by PHI. This is already given to you. This is from the data uh, divided by FR, you see. Look at here. This is not going to, this is not a function of I. So you really don't need to compute it. If you want to compute this, this of course is the same as integral of FR given HI multiplied by PHI, right? And, the, uh, and you have to sum up over all i's. But you don't have to do this because the denominator is a function independent of h. So you really need to do this and see which is uh, where it peaks. You can also do the logarithm of this, in which case it will be this sum. So maximum a posteriori probability, or it is also known as map estimator. Maximum this m, this a, this p. So it's known as this is a map uh, estimator. We will come to this in another context next week. But uh, MRE detection, map estimator is optimum. Or the ma uh, maximum a posteriori probability detection is maximum under this cost function. So let me stop here. I hope you have four homeworks, right? I mean, four uh, uh, handouts. And I hope your homeworks are here. And uh, let me give you the, what to read next week. Just hold on. So section 2.2, that's I think 2.2 or. So please read up at the very minimum. So I remember I asked you to read up, up to chapter, up to page 52. 2.4, estimation theory, that's what we are going to start, 2.4. Most likely we will, now estimation I'm going to stay, I mean, I will start with this, but we'll be using other books also, 2.41, 2.42, but we won't get through 2.42 is going to take us a couple of lectures. But at the very least you can read 52 through 60, 64, 65, 64, how about that? 64 is good. So 10, 12 pages. Have dinner and sit down and start reading, right? Any questions? I will also be upstairs there if you want to talk to me. Right. Thank you.